All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, our speaker will speak. Second, I'm sorry, first there'll be some announcements. The second part is our speaker, Michael Sincoma Ford, will then speak for up to about an hour. We will then take questions and answers. And after the question and answer period, we'll then have our way to uh, give our rebuttal period. We generally finish up about nine o'clock. Um, and if you're looking to get uh, some things, I'm gonna now entertain announcements. So Charlie, I'm gonna share the screen with the uh, <coughs> announcement section. So take it away when you're ready. All right, I wanna welcome everyone to meeting number, <coughs> excuse me, 3,635 of the College of Complexes the playground for people who think. And can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. First of all, we have a relatively new Google email list and uh, a meetup list. So if you want to receive uh, an email regarding the upcoming program of the week, uh, there isn't a lot of traffic. Uh, please sign up for either one of those. Also, we're in the process of setting up a YouTube channel to uh, have the recordings that's in progress and we'll keep you advised as to uh, progress in that regard. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On October the 2nd, I see she's here tonight. Jeanne Lee will give us a taste of Taoism or Taoism, whichever you prefer. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Uh, she apparently made a trip to China as well uh, to visit a, a, a Taoist center. So October the 2nd, next Saturday. On October 9th and the 30th, they have not been named, but we will feature candidates for the office running in Illinois of the Illinois Green Party. So we keep you advised. I, I believe one of them will be the senator, the candidate for senator. Following that on October 16th, we're having a someone from the uh, the Department of Criminology at a local college who would tell us about consumer fraud. College of DuPage. Um, yes, I know that. Um, I think, you think I didn't know it or what? No, I just, I didn't think you weren't, uh, just, just Let me, let, can I speak? All right, we're talking about fraud such as uninterrupted calls that you get all day and various measures. They seem to be on the uptake these days um, uh, with the COVID situation. Yeah. Nevertheless, that is an important and very, I have sat through the program once and found it to be very, very informative. Subsequent to that, uh, we have four open dates in November. Uh, there seems to be a reluctance of many organizations or speakers to use the Zoom format. So if anyone is interested in speaking and has not done so before or has a work in progress, I would very much like to hear from you. Nevertheless, November 6, 13, 20, and 27 are coming up at the college, or new speakers at the college complexes. Okay, Tim. Now what you about uh, what about October twenty third? Oh, October the twenty third, uh, Jim Pfizer um, will be returning, a conspiracy theorist of some nationwide known, and will be talking all about COVID and the uh, vaccination. So it should be a wide open evening. <laughs> He's got the inside scoop on what's going on with all that, at least according to him. All right, Tim, thank you. Take it away. 
Okay, I just also want to make a plug for our sister campus that meets on um, on uh, on in Texas, and I'm going to share the screen with you on there because they are they are still opening on Thursday, which I'll just give a brief shout out to them. Uh, bear with me for a second here while I get them up. But anyway, on Thursday, just, uh, come on. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. What we do is we go to the, um, on, on the main page, uh, there's a link to the Texas campus here, if I can find it. Uh, hang on here. Yeah, there we go. Texas campus. And they're having, um, they're on Thursday, September 30th, can Afghanistan trigger a paradigm change? And I think that was Pat, that's on Thursday, September 30th. Thursday, October 7th, they're having the future of transportation predicted by popular science and whatnot. And their next open date is October 14th. I've been there before and it's a very interesting format similar to this. So if any of you uh, wanna speak at another college of complexes thing that's hosted out of Dallas, just contact Tom Barry. Enough said about that. Is there any other announcements that anybody wants to do before we get into our main speaker tonight? Okay, uh, let's introduce uh, Michael Sheen Comerford. And Mike, if you're ready, uh, let's go ahead and uh, share your screen and let's get you going on your speech. All right. Well, uh, I'll get over to the sharing part in a second. I'm just going to uh, just remind people that last year, around this time, actually in August, uh, I was here talking about um, my book at that time, uh, American Oz. I was I spent a year in traveling carnivals. I uh, I was in rides and games, and I worked for, from California to New York. Uh, Chicago, New Jersey, Chicago, Alaska, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Texas, Georgia, and in uh, Florida, where in Florida I was in a freak show, but I didn't get on stage because I didn't see the inner freak in me. A bally, by the way, is uh, a kamali for uh, a guy at a, at a sideshow. And uh, the Valley of American Oz, I'm only going to give you four lines of it, but it's a few more. But uh, from, uh, from Alaska to Mexico, New York to Cali, from Dallas to Chi-Town, hear my valley. Say no to the square life, say no to the blahs, say yes to the wonders of American Oz. And this is who I am. Uh, and this is the author bio from the back of the book so that uh, it's uh, very flattering, but it's uh, nonetheless will give you a better idea of who I am. Go uh, I'm a little bit about how it went on, how it's doing on Amazon. Oh, on Amazon, it is uh, uh, number one in nine categories on Amazon, and it has been almost the entire year. And uh, so it's doing, it's self-published. It's doing phenomenally well for a self-published book. Uh, and and uh, however, as I said to Tim earlier, uh, it's Amazon bestsellers. It's not the New York Times bestsellers. Yeah, I know, and you wouldn't be talking to us otherwise, as you said. <laughs> I said that earlier. I know, I know. I'd be, I'd be in a limo now, and I wouldn't have gone across the country in a, on a bicycle. I would have gone in a limo. Um, so I am an award-winning former international journalist who worked in Chicago, New York, Budapest, and Moscow. I bicycled four times across the United States and hitchhiked across America, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. I've ridden freight trains and rounded up cattle out west, studied Buddhism in the Himalayas, and won a heavyweight boxing championship in Ireland. <laughs> I toured almost 100 countries. I've swum the headwater. I've swum the headwaters of the Nile, fought off a hippo attack, and toured ecological disaster areas in the Amazon. Wow. I live in the Chicago area to be near my daughter. I promised her I'd stay closer to home for a while. <laughs> it turned out to be overpromising because. Uh, uh, we're now moving to LA in the fall. So she moved to LA already, and uh, I'm going to move out there too. Um, so that is uh, um, mm -hmm. that. Is that. Uh, it has 280 reviews. Some of them are great, for, like from Stuart Dybeck, who is a Guggenheim and MacArthur winner, mm -hmm. and from Carnies. I had just got two Carnies this week who, who uh -huh. texted me. And uh, that's the way I wanted to be written, uh, read. I wanted it to be, have levels like Huck Finn. 
where you read it as a kid and say, hey, what fun, that adventure. And uh, then, uh, or as an adult and say, wow, there's a lot more going on to this than, uh, than I thought before. And so the deeper you read, the more you'll see. So I highly recommend my book, American Oz. This is, I was at the, uh, I was at the um, uh, book fest last week. And uh, that's my that's my sign from there. And uh, anyway, uh, getting on to the story cycle, I wanted to uh, get uh, quickly move on to that and uh, and how it started. But first, uh, I think everybody knows how serious it is. But I wanted to get uh, update everybody on the numbers. Uh, 688,000 people are dead now in the United States. Uh, Four point five five million uh, worldwide. In Illinois, uh, the total cases, these are all official government statistics. So if you want to believe them, that's up to you. Uh, but the, these are the government statistics, total cases being 1.6 million, seven day positivity, 3.7. Uh, total tested here in Illinois, 31 million. Doses, 15 million. Totally vac fully vaccinated, 53% here in Illinois. The total deaths uh, in the, uh, in Illinois, uh, no, uh, yeah, 25,000. So 25,000 Illinoisans are dead from it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S., there were 389, so almost 300, almost 400 million doses have been given out. 183 million people have been vaccinated, and the USA is 55.7% fully vaccinated whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, the way this all started out is in January, uh, we were having a 9-11 every day. 3,000 people a day were dying. Uh, in February, I had a dream and it relates back to a dinner I had with Paul Salopek, a, a two-time uh, Pulitzer winner with the Chicago Tribune. He and I had a dinner at the uh, Intercontinental and he talked about slow journalism, and he's currently on a slow journalism project. He is walking around the world to trace the uh, uh, migration of humankind from the Ethiopian, Ethiopian Rift across Asia, uh, the Bering Strait, and down to the tip of South America. And he's in uh, Myanmar now. And uh, he uh, and I talked about slow journalism, walking, and actually reporting on, on, on the world this way. Well, in my dream, I kind of connected his discussion with all this news that was happening. And I knew big uh, landmarks were coming up, including uh, there was going to be pretty soon, it was the one year anniversary of being called a pandemic, 500,000 people were gonna be dead and we were in the midst of the world's largest rollout of vaccinations in history. So it was, even though the dream came during the polar vortex in February, I waited a few days till the polar vortex had moved on and I jumped on my bicycle and I decided to ride my bicycle on uh, what's called Route 66, America's main street from Chicago to LA. And, uh, I wanted to take five minute videos of people talking about how they're surviving uh, this pandemic because most people don't die in pandemics. They live as we have lived through every pandemic and plague in human history. They do so by telling themselves stories and they are betting their life on those stories. So this was my attempt to listen to how and why Americans come to believe what they believe. And uh, I got some resistance from my daughter who was uh, 15 at the time. She hugged me and cried and said, hey, I, I feel like this is a death ride, dad. And I called my Pointer Institute teacher down in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And I said, you've been covering COVID. Any suggestions on how I should do this on video? And he, sa he just said, don't go. And the reason was because I believe is because he was afraid I was gonna get it, or I was gonna bring it from Chicago out to places that don't have it yet. So 
there was a lot of resistance at the very beginning to this whole thing. But I managed to line up before I left. Um, well, and, and one more rule I had before I left, not only that these videos would be five minutes long, but also that, but that also that um, uh, I would never tell anyone that my, my opinions, I would never say, uh, why that's crazy. <laughs> Or that's going to get you killed. No, I was there to listen to other people. And I wouldn't tell them my religious ideas. I wouldn't tell them my political ideas. And I wouldn't tell them my COVID uh, uh, views. But I did get the University of Florida's Samuel Proctor Oral History Association to back me. And they agreed to edit, archive, post my uh, videos. And they're going to do a major talk, talk on this uh, project to the Oral History Association next year. And by the way, they have a high regard for Chicago's oral history telling traditions and for Studs Terkel himself. Uh, so I got a, an adventure bicycling association map because Route 66 isn't a, doesn't really exist anymore. It, it, uh, it's historically with this great highway where uh, East Coast met West Coast, or actually the Midwest meets the West Coast, but people go out there to find their dreams. But uh, now it's all broken up and some of it's uh, interstates, but the uh, Adventure Highway, the Venture Bicycling Association has a map. And so for 2,500 miles and eight states, I rode through Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California. And uh, I, I wrote, and it's called America's Main Street because it is the main street of scores of small towns across America, across the Midwest and the West. So this is an attempt to show what, how and why Americans believe what they believe. Provide a record of how people felt in this time and also to provide insights into past and future pandemics. Or if this is one long forever pandemic as some, uh, some predict. Now the COVID pandemic has surpassed the death toll for the 1918 Spanish flu. And speculation is that we may never reach herd immunity either in the United States or in the world. Indeed, uh, eradication, if there is no eradication worldwide, it will be uh, in the US for the foreseeable future. When I finished this ride, I was elated because uh, I rode through snowstorms, hail, freezing sleet, and 50 mile an hour headwinds. I rode through the Great Plains, the Ozark Mountains, the Texas Panhandle across the mesas, the Mojave Desert, and the Continental Divide in a snowstorm. I slept in sub-freezing weather in Illinois, in a Civil War cemetery in Missouri, and and in cheap motels where the check-in desk was at the local gas station across the street. And in the, in the Mojave Desert, I slept outside on top of my sleeping bag and under the dark sky where there was no light pollution, just billions of stars above me, like rivers of stars flowing in eddies. I was in towns of 12 people and in ghost towns. I rode through Chicago, St. Louis, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Flagstaff, and, and Los Angeles. I was thrilled by the diversity of our country and of our geography and our weather, thrilled by the diversity of our people. However, people asked me what was the most shocking and astonishing thing about this trip, and it was un, no, no uh, question about it. It was the articulate people who I ended up speaking to who were art, so articulate about, when, about speaking about their own lives. Oh yeah, you know. They were making tons of mistakes. You could see them making these mistakes. I came back with a hundred videos, all about, and most of them short. There's one that's like 20 minutes, but there's mostly five minute videos. And they were making mistakes, which I saw myself making, my family making, everyone around me making, because I was studying them. And some of them were anchoring bias, availability heuristic bias, bandwagon effect, choice supportive bias, 
ostrich bias, outcome bias, overconfidence, placebo bias, survivorship bias, selective per perception bias, confirmation bias, and the big one, blind spot bias, which is sometimes called the bias bias. Everyone else is biased but me. In the end, my understanding of how humans react to a pandemic deepened, and I'm still putting my final thoughts together on it. As the 19th century Danish philosopher Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood backwards when it must be lived forwards. I'm still going through the 100 videos and writing the story cycle is what it's called, and I want to uh, release it this fall. In the meantime, I can tell you it makes sense when you're out there to want to go maskless when you, it makes more sense, I'm sorry, when you live in a town in New Mexico, in a, in a mesa in New Mexico with no one for hundreds of miles away and in a town of 12. When a person who lives alone in the desert, in the desert on a desert highway tells you they don't believe a half a million people have died of COVID, consider that those uh, kind of numbers are insane and purely fantastical to them. One of the lessons of the 1918 pandemic, supposedly, uh, as I have read, is that the government shouldn't lie to the people about the severity of it. But there were reasons to lie at the time. We were engaged in World War I, but the first thing the government did when this COVID came around was tell us that masks don't help and may even hurt. So backers of the policy thought the noble lie would help hospital workers get more masks. The media downplayed the pandemic in 1918 too, maybe intentionally, maybe not. So in the end, so doctors sometimes lie. Some, sometimes doctors have been wrong in the past. Every side of a vaccination de uh, debate has a doctor showing up on TV, either to call COVID either a flu or sounding an alarm. The media has been wrong in the past. The government has lied and has been wrong in the past too. So, but some of these people will say, hey, my friend Jerry never lied to me and he was cured by taking a cow dewormer, uh, uh, ivermectin. And within hours he was breathing great. Your doctor can't vouch, uh, my doctor can't vouch for ivermectin, but says uh, he knows people who are alive today who swear that they cured him. And some doctors agree and TV shows push it. And maybe an upcoming uh, speaker to you is gonna push it. The, the story cycle is a mix of slow journalism and oral history. And I can tell you that when I was a newspaper man, I would, I would, I spent most of my life as a newspaper man. I would isolate the best few quotes and put them in context of a bigger picture. But with short videos, you can see people's faces and hear their inflections. You hear the nuances that they are, uh, that aren't the great quotes, but are great context. You see their age, their weight, their health, their dress, their facial expressions, and hear their accents and sometimes hear their hearts talking to you. No commentary, no preconceived notions of bias, just people talking about how they plan to save their own lives and how it makes sense to them, even if it doesn't make sense to the majority. It's up to you as the viewer or someday the reader of the story cycle to ridicule or understand or take action. But the story cycle is an original idea and it's an original story and I've never heard of anything like it and there are insights made and maybe it will someday help us navigate this scourge in our world. And uh, let me say that this has gotten a lot of attention. The Chicago Tribune put me on the front page of their uh, arts and entertainment, and I will show this to you now. I've never seen this big a coverage for a book that hasn't been. I haven't seen this big a coverage. I went to journalism school at Northwestern. I don't remember seeing this big a coverage for anything. I mean, anything like it, but here's the top of the arts and entertainment. That's me with my bicycle at, uh, at uh, Buckingham Fountain. Here, Rick Kogan calling me adventurous spirit. And, uh, and the inside page is most of the inside page too. And there's me looking like uh, Superman, looking off in the distance. <laughs> so uh, it got 
uh, coverage from the Tribune, WBEZ, had a fantastic uh, uh, interview with me. Really, the best one was WBEZ uh, with Sasha Ann Simons, uh, Chicago Public Radio, WGN TV News, WGN Radio, After Hours with Rick Kogan, uh, John Records, Landecker on WGN, WLS, Big John Howell Show, The Hidden Truth by a Fox News broadcaster, uh, Jim Basio, Fromer's Travel Show, the Arizona Daily Sun put me on the front page centerpiece. Uh, Santa Monica Daily Press, the, flag the Flagstaff Business News, the, uh, the Texarkana Gazette, Route 66 News, Bloomington Daily Pantograph, and Yahoo uh, News. And so those are, uh, so I got the word out that we're doing it. And now let's try to get to the shared screen. And uh, I'm going to press shared screen, right? And uh, there we go. So here is just my introductory uh, film. And I won't bore you with 100 videos, but I have a, a couple that I thought were particularly salient. But this is the introductory vi video where I started out in February because the weather is part of the story. The story cycle from Chicago to LA on US Route 66. It is about 2,500 miles. I'm going to ride and talk to people about COVID stories, about five minute long videotaped uh, conversations, about their tragic, funny, compelling stories of how they're surviving in this historic, in these historic times. That was Michael Sean Comerford before he set out. That's WGN. But let me uh, pull up here a, uh, another video for you. This is the, uh, the story cycle uh, main page for my uh, 100 videos. And the beginning has uh, editor's choice. This fellow I met in, uh, Four months. this Eight. man I, I met Four. in um, the Ozark Mountains. And I had a bicycle breakdown and he, uh, helped me get to the next town, but he is a bait shop, good old boy, hunter, fisherman, and uh, you'll see he got COVID and he has a story to tell, dramatic. The stuff had, uh, went, had COVID, COVID was taking over my heart and lungs, like I said, it didn't help. Uh, the treatment wasn't helping. They were talking about shipping me to KU Medical Center up in Kansas City at that point. Uh, the doctor said, hey, let's try one more round. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to ship him off. They tried one more round. My white blood cells fired back up. Thank the Lord. Um, my body had already sustained the damage to my heart and lungs. So I am now uh, going through the heart monitor process. Uh, uh, it's not working like it should. Uh, my lungs are at a weakened capacity. Uh, my neurology uh he's a long hauler stand on all these uh, uh, all, on all the, the the latter side of this I, I do what the state has done our state has opened it back up uh if a business says hey you need a mask i'll put a mask on at the hospital because the hospital says hey you need to have a mask on to come into your appointments i put a mask on coming in here it was i i you know any doubt that I had. Oh, there it uh, is. You know, oh, COVID this, COVID that. Is there, here it is. Hey, you need a mask. I'll put a mask on. At the here hospital, he the hospital says, hey, you need to have a mask on to come into your appointments. I put a mask on. Coming in here, you, it, I leave it up to the individuals. I, I, you know, before all this, we would joke and cut up and laugh about, it, you know, oh, COVID this, COVID that. Is it really real? I'm telling you right now that any doubt that I had, any joke that I made, any lightness that I made of the subject is absolutely, I, I regret it. I regret it uh, because I've had it. I've been through it. I've seen it. My friends have had it and I've had friends that have passed away from it and uh, family. And it's not a joke. It's real. Uh, I don't know where it came from. I hope that we can get past it. Like I said, I, as far as masking, I don't wear a mask now. I feel like then the my doctors have told me, hey, you're good for three or four months afterwards, you know, uh, as far as taking the shot, my I'm not allowed to take the shot. My pulmonologist told me that it, it was not in my best interest to take the shot. 
um, because of the vaccine is part of COVID. It has, you know, has COVID in it. Uh, so he told me not, absolutely do not take the vaccine. So stuff that I took, I took two rounds. Uh, you you got to believe in some higher power. Um, and, and this is where he said, is this the new normal? Or are we going? To... Um, and, and like I said, for me, I'd have to say that the, I, there's a miracle involved somewhere along the way. A miracle for you. Uh, and that's, that's how I'm here today. And the grace of God, you know, but I'm trying to save you the whole video, but I, I somehow missed the, the best part. Is part of COVID. I regret it. This, we would joke and the, the latter side of, you know, we, we have a six, six whole thing. I mean, um, you know, they being sick and all that. Well, I won't do it to you. I obviously Sorry. failed on that. But what happened is uh, he breaks down and cries about um, the fact that he couldn't uh, meet with his uh, fiance, and he thought he was going to die without being able to meet with her. And he reached out his hand to her. She reached out her hand to him, and uh, he cried. And uh, uh, I thought this was at the seven minute mark, but I won't make you go through the whole uh, drama. But he's a long hauler now, and he's on my Facebook, and his niece just died. Uh, last month of COVID. Um, this is a, this is a rancher. For my, well, not a neighbor, a, a guy that butchers my cattle, he calls me in the middle of the night because he found out from a day or two before that I had COVID. And uh, one of his best friends passed away and he said, you need to take ivermectin tonight. Don't horse around. I can't believe you haven't took it. So here it is, about three o'clock in the morning, I go out to the barn and find some injectable ivermectin and I didn't know what it was going to taste like. So I figured, well, I'll just dose it out like you do a cow about my weight. And I figured, well, I need to take two cc. So I took two cc of that the first night. Next day, I felt quite a bit better. And that was Christmas. Didn't go nowhere. Two cc's. Did you swallow it? Yeah, I put it in apple juice and just mixed it up. And then, so he told me to take it three days in a row. And I did the second, I, like Christmas, I felt so good. I didn't mess with it. And I still didn't go town or nothing. And the 26th, all that crap comes back again. A whole lot worse. I mean, it wasn't perfect by no means on the 25th, but I was better. So the 26th, I'm back kind of like I was, having trouble breathing. My heart rate was way up. So I get the ivermectin again and take two cc's of that. And then got dexamethasone, which is what we give. So now he's taking two cattle uh, medicines, one that is good for pneumonia and one is good for deworming. Cattle, if they get pneumonia or something, and make help them breathe easier. So I figured out what that was going to be, and that was 2cc. And uh, so I put 2cc of ivermectin and a 2cc of dexamethasone and some apple juice. Gave it a stir, drank it. Well, in about hours i guess i could start breathing a whole lot easier so four hours later that's amazing and uh so that is that was a big deal uh, i i did that interview in uh it's in april and now it was a uh, big you know news over the summer but because people are not uh taking the proper amount and uh but um he also goes on to say he told his doctor that I'm taking this, and his doctor said, "How much? And how uh, how many doses?" And he says, "I know so many people taking it." And then he told his vet, and his vet said, "You know what? Uh, the main thing you did wrong was take it in the barn. It's unsanitary in the barn. Here's a fresh vial of dewormer for cattle, ivermectin." And uh, then at the end, he says, Mike, I didn't say this on the, on the camera, but I looked down in the toilet and there was a green worm that long in the toilet. I had dewormed myself. I cured myself of COVID and I dewormed myself. Anyway, and then this guy, is a performance artist and uh, ladies, uh, this might be, there's some profanity in here. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, uh, 
uh, not listen to this part. But this is the edited section at the beginning of the every one of these videos. You can see uh, how uh, the University of Florida Samuel Proctor oral history program did it for us. But this guy's in Western Oklahoma, Harley Russell. He's a performance artist, but he lives all by himself. It's a big spot. I'm right here in Eric, Oklahoma, the redneck capital of the world. Would you believe where you can see rednecks work and play in their own environment in San Antonio, the Spanish, right here at the world class, world famous San Antonio's Curiosity Shop, the only bus stop in town. Yeah, this is where people come from all over the world to get their bumps, kicks, grinds, tricks, dicks, and big pricks on 66. And I'll tell you what, in spite of the COVID virus, they still did it. 99% of my visitors do come from overseas. So they didn't come over last year. But I'm going to tell you what happened. The Americans got cabin fever and they couldn't sit still in a room by themselves with nothing distracting them long enough to even get started. So they got cabin fever, got out on the road and started coming to see me. So in spite of COVID, I had a good year. So i tell you what, Dr. Fauci, now she don't get dick shit for nothing from me. What? <laughs> and now uh, this is... Uh... So this is me on uh, Santa Monica Pier talking about the end of the uh, trip. And uh, actually, I'm talking about how I boinked in the Mojave Desert. And I was laying down in the desert with a towel over my face. I couldn't go one foot farther. I was loose. I was dehydrated. I was in danger of, of heat stroke. And somebody came along and said, hey, the Mojave Desert uh, Cultural Center is, open, is, is closed, but we run it. And I said, I know, I saw the, the gate closed. And he goes, yeah, come on in and we'll give you water. And, uh, and then I found out that they were uh, musicians. And so this is your final uh, video. Almost miraculous turnaround. They're the only people in Goff, almost only. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh. <laughs> so that's that. If there's anything else, I open it up to questions now. And uh, I have questions. I do. Hold on here. Let's shut off some okay. of this stuff. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Okay, hold on. Tim, can I ask you questions? Stop share. There we go. Can I ask you questions? Yes. Okay. My first question: uh, <clears throat> Which newspaper are you working for? I'm not working for anybody. I'm working for myself. I'm a writer, and uh, I live pretty close to the bone. I'm living uh, pretty much on the right now on the proceeds of American Oz, which isn't much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm going to write this book, and then I hope to write lots of books in the future. So I get up a, an arsenal of books and can live off, be okay. a full-time writer. 
But mm -hmm. I worked in the past. I worked for the Chicago Tribune, the Sun Times, and the Daily Herald. I worked for the Moscow Times, the Budapest Sun, the Budapest Business Journal, and I worked for the New York Daily News, Belgian Courier. Do you speak Russian by any chance? I speak Russian. And yet, yet. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Okay, fine. No, not much. I knew a little bit when I was there. I was with an English language paper called Moscow Times that doesn't oh. exist now. Thank you, Mr. Putin. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> if you uh, do propaganda about COVID, why are you not wearing mask? Are you wearing mask? I'm, uh, I'm indoor. Currently, I am indoors and nobody is in this house. Okay, fine. But when you're outside, do you wear mask when you're going to store in public places? Um, that is not part of the story. The, the story is not what I believe and what I do. Um, if I'm hypocritical or if I'm uh, if I'm an example of a being of sainthood. Uh, all I wanted to do is find out what other people believe, put it all together, look at it again, write about it, and move on. Okay, okay. and uh, you know, uh, one more question, if I may. Uh, I understand this very controversial topic. I myself in holistic medicine field. Okay, so. And I hear so many doctors, uh, so many uh, traditional doctors, and so many different doctors. Uh, I understand it, so many opinions. So I asking you, I begging you, I refer you, go to listen on YouTube, Dr. Caldwell, C O L D W E Caldwell. Okay, I begging you, and please. If you can give me your email, I would like your opinion later, because today was again, again, and again, I will listen to his speech. He's a Dr. MD for 47 years, right now, and, you know, I just, I don't want to blah, blah, blah. I just want you to listen what he has to say, like medical doctor, like he gives speech all over the world, all over the world, and what his opinion like doctor, like really PhD, medical doctor about pharma, about what they do to people. I'm not saying all pharma bad, but okay. what pharma and what government together, what they try okay. to do to people okay. in the field, it's ridiculous and it's not all, all right. Mr. Michael, okay? So if you can give me your email or- <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. enough, please. Okay, and please go to Dr. Coldwell. I would like to actually. Juliana, please. There are okay, other thank people you. There. All right, Janice, go ahead. You got your hand raised. <clears throat> unmute, Jan. Oh, okay, Good. I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> you, are, you are. I'm going to lower your hand. Uh, Good. Did you lower it for me? Yes, I did. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I just have simple questions. First of all, Ivermectin, which uh, some of the guests mentioned, um, is that the the drug that uh, a Chicago hospital would not give to uh, an anti vaxxer who was in a Chicago hospital who had COVID? Right, because it's not FDA approved, um, but uh, as we've just heard, there are many doctors who say it's great, it's used abroad, uh, it's approved abroad. Uh, however, the, the makers of ivermectin have said, do not use this because it's not approved by the FDA. I, I do not take a position on this, but I, as you can see, this guy believes it, that's for sure. And I've seen numerous um, uh, videos online where people have said it, it saved their life. I, it's the very thing that you're talking about. And, uh, but so does, so does all the um, medicines that the other medicines that, the, that we're using too now. And uh, in his guy's case that, that we, we talked to in Western Oklahoma, Canute, um, he went to his doctor they said, well, we want to test and to see if you're positive, and that's not coming back till Tuesday, a week. And uh, he, uh, he, he thought that night he was going to die. He thought he was going to die. And he had a phone call from a friend who said, uh, you're needlessly suffering, and you do what we, I did, and you will be better. And uh, 
he took one dose and he was better for a day. And then, then he made a, then he, he didn't do the second day and he got worse. And then the third day he took an, an two more doses and, uh, and he was better within four hours. All I'm saying is that was his experience or what he thinks is his experience. We all know that we think we're experiencing things and, and it's just not, not real. It's not really happening. But I, all I'm here to do is to chronicle these people uh, and what they believe and how these stories that they're telling themselves, and like we're all telling ourselves. And it's not just rural people listening to their friends. I went to Hollywood. There's a video in here with a big Hollywood agent. And he knows, I, I, you know, he, he told me I'd know most of his, I forget now, some of the people he represented in his life. He was an elderly guy, not elder, elderly, but in his 80s. And he, and he says, um, I know the, the best cure. It's just not a, you know, I do too. I know the best cure. And it's somebody up in San Francisco and my friends know all about it. And my, my, another friend of mine took it and she's 100% better. And if I get it, I'm definitely going to take it. And it's, and people yeah, are listening the to their friends. That's placebo effect. <laughs> people are listening to their friends. Well, I listed off 12 right at the, in my, in my uh, speech, all the different biases, the 12 major biases they think that we, we go through when we make decisions. And uh, I fall into those. And everyone does. Um, and your your article that was in the Trib and on WGN and stuff, I get the Trib. So what's the date that you of the newspaper you showed us? June eighth, Tuesday, June eighth. Oh, I have that paper. Thank you. And it is uh, the idea came to me in a dream. It says in the pull quote. <laughs> Adventurous spirit, Chicago writer, and uh, and the great Rick Kogan did the story, and he's a fabulous, fabulous. He's mm -hmm. he's got to be one of the greatest writers in America. Are you vaccinated? Did you did you do vaccine? I I really do, I prefer not to say. Sure. Uh, you know what? I think I will. I, I will say I got the vaccine in in uh, Albuquerque because I felt it was irresponsible of me to spread it. What and uh, I, I was in danger of spreading it. I was interviewing people, a hundred or more, way more than a hundred. And I was going around and uh, I was in danger of killing other people. So uh, when I could get it, I went to a Walgreens in Albuquerque and got a J&J. &J. What kind of vaccine? Tim, yeah, Johnson, 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 Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, you know, what, let him go. It's, it's Margaret's talking, and she no. just. She is asking another question. Are you chairing or not? Just sitting I'm around. Cha oh, Ch Charlie, I'm chairing. It's as right. good as all me. Well, guess what? We can mute you too if we need to, but uh, let's keep going with yeah, the meeting. Well, why don't you do your job, man? I think I am. Now let's knock it off and get back with One the questions, Charlie. The <laughs> Charlie, question. knock it off. Stop questioning, Charlie. All right. Please. Now, no, Lana, we, we understand, okay? All right, Michael, let's go ahead. Now that was the end. Uh, I mean, all I, I, I just thought, uh, I was asked by the Arizona Sun, which put me again, front page centerpiece. Uh, that is amazing. When I, whenever I was a journalist, I, I just, I just, dreamed of getting the front page uh, story, but now I was the front page story. And he said, you are talking to these people who are anti-mask and anti-vaccine. Don't you ever want to tell them you've got to save your life. You're going to, you're going to kill other people and you got, and you're going to get, you're going, you putting yourself at risk, your children at risk, your, your, the people you love it most in the world. Don't you, why don't you say something? Don't you think it's irresponsible what you're doing? Potentially spreading it, getting it yourself and not telling anyone what they should do. And I go, well, that's not the project. The project is just to listen. And if I didn't, I didn't wanna say that I was vaccinated either, but I think I, I think I just have to. I am part of the story. It turns out that I am part of the story. I'm not an invisible reporter. I was, I was bicycling. I was going through those mountains and I was going 
through those deserts and I was sleeping outside and uh, and I had to get and I and I did a, a personal update once a week or once every two weeks and it took two months by the way to ride the distance. Wow. I okay. All right, Margaret, you were is that is that the end of your questions, Margaret? Margaret, is that the end of your questions? Well, I haven't asked a question. My question is, you came through Texas, and I was just curious, where did you go in Texas, and did you interview anyone in Texas? I'm in Dallas. <laughs> You're in Dallas? Yes. <laughs> I just is had, two weeks ago, I had a, uh, a, a book club from Dallas. Um, it, was, it was terrific. Another dozen women, and it was really, really spectacular. And uh, and by the way, I was and for American Oz. I worked the State Fair of Texas, which is coming up this weekend. Um, and and uh, it's a great fair, man. And it is it's a great chapter. And it's two chapters in my book. Um, so uh, I went through the Panhandle through Amarillo. Yes, it's it's a Texas is very broad, very big, and of course very diverse. You know, yeah. no, the cities are generally tend to be blue and the rural area is red. Thank you so much. I was just curious. This is so interesting. Well, I got to say another thing. And, and as you know, earlier I was asked uh, what my beliefs are and, and so forth. Uh, and I said one of my rules was that I wasn't going to talk about uh, God, politics, or, or COVID. And, uh, but I would say between uh, the Ozarks and Texas, uh, almost half of the people as first asked me, and not, not half, that's exaggerating, but a lot, a major portion of them asked me before they would answer, first, do you know Jesus? And I go, well, I, I'm not going to tell you. I can't tell you if I know Jesus. And, uh, and, and so that's how it went. I mean, everybody wanted to know who I was before they uh, would speak to me. I'd say I'm from Chicago and I felt like, holy crap, they're going to all think I'm a big city guy who looks down on them. But uh, uh, I, I found people extremely articulate, as I said in the speech. I mean, it was really amazing. I mean, things you can't make up. Oh, I love those. So it's, I think it's yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Tim, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Chien, you're next. Can you hear me now? Yep. There's a there's a mute button on my microphone that I use sometimes that uh, it's a little easier than the, the thing and I forget sometimes. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, um, I have a question about um, do you have a, like the story that impressed you most? Is there any surprises? And does that process change, has changed you in any ways? What's your big lesson you learned through that interviewing process? The process deepened my understanding of human beings and, and how they tell stories to survive. And this is part of our human condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what we, since we evolved, this is, and it's going to continue happening. And uh, and so, I just think this is an insight into the various opinions and how people come to them, and where they are, and how that makes a uh, a difference in what they think. Um, and uh, if they're in the middle of the desert, I can tell you, I, I'm, I'm betting that they're just not vaxxers and maskers. And uh, none of their friends are, and they've only got 12 <laughs> or 11. And uh, uh, I don't have a favorite. Um, I, if you play that whole uh, rancher one, he cries at several points and that whole uh, 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 one of the Ozarks guy who couldn't reach out to touch his uh, wife uh, or his uh, fiance, uh, he cries. Um, those are dramatic, but I don't know that they're all only my favorites. I, I interviewed a couple 
people that worked at Walmart and, uh, and then a, a dollar store, a woman who worked at the dollar store and her life has turned completely upside down. And her children are, uh, can't, uh, have learning disabilities. Her husband lost his job. She was a civil engineer making huge money. She lost her job. She was working at the dollar store, all of it because of COVID. And, uh, and oh my God, I looked at her and I go, how do you do it? And she goes, well, I don't know either, but I'm on a lot of depressive medicine. Uh. <laughs> and I go, well, I, you know, there again, I can't say, well, I can't say that's good or bad or, or what, but it was, uh, people's lives were, are, continue to be completely uprooting uh, and overturned. And, uh, you know, some people have had religious experiences. One guy in Missouri said that he was now going to go preach to the world. And, uh, and he was starting at a motel. He was, he was a uh, motel room cleaner, but he's going to start humble and, and change the world from there. And, uh, but everybody uh, is affected. If they didn't, if, if they didn't uh, you know what? And we were early enough in that, uh, and I take that back because we were early enough in the pandemic, early enough, we were uh, one year into it literally. Uh, but some people didn't know anybody who had had COVID and they'd never had it. They didn't know anyone who'd had it. They didn't know anyone who knew anyone who had it. And, uh, but there were a lot of conspiracies. I knew one woman in uh, Albuquerque. Oh, yeah, it was in Albuquerque. She was working with the Indians, uh, Indian, Native Americans out there. And uh, she was uh, Mexican-American. And she said, uh, this is, and, and she wasn't the only one, said it was a government uh, plot to kill off the Indians, uh, Indians, but she mentioned a tribe, the Native Americans, and, uh, and several people said it was uh, all the government's idea to control us and keep track of us and control us. And uh, so there were a lot of people who believed it was the government was out to get us. A That's lot of right. People. That's right. Okay. That's right. Right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's out there and you're not alone. But I will say this. Another, one thing that did uh, surprise me, Jan, is uh, Facebook. Because uh, I was, uh, I'm a mainstream journalist and they, they took me down twice, two of my videos down, saying they were propagating false uh, narratives. And uh, I took the, inter inter um, uh, the, uh, the interference or the, uh, the intercession, sorry, of the University of Florida to put a, um, at the beginning and ending of all my videos saying I, no, and at the end, uh, saying that th I do not endorse any of these opinions. These are, this is strictly a project to tell what other people are believing. But I was within a, one uh, video of being three strikes out. And in fact, uh, YouTube, uh, um, uh, they, uh, Facebook <coughs> took my post off of your site and told, uh, told me that it uh, referred to the story cycle and that uh, that uh, this was against community standards. Jeez. So you you were censored. Your site was censored. Well, can I have a follow up question? How 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 did you choose the the people you interview? Did did, did you have a like a plan strategy, or you no. just anyone? no? I I just I just knew that when I was in a Native American area around uh, reservations, I better get a lot of Native Americans. And uh, I knew that I wasn't going to get enough African Americans. So I made a special uh, uh, effort to meet African Americans and get African American opinions. And, uh, uh, and, and Mexicans. And so I wanted to get uh, and Asians, Asians in California. Um, so that's I, I went for demographics, uh, but other than that, 
uh, it was all people I met along the road. And on this bicycle ride, I had on the back of my bicycle, a sign that says, and I should have brought it in, uh, that said, tell me a story. And it was a big sign. It was three feet long. It's as big as this sign, only it was, it said, tell me a story. And uh, so people would come across parking lots and uh, they'd say, tell you a story, tell you a story about what? And I go, well, five minute conversation about COVID and I'll film it and I'll put it on YouTube and, the, and uh, they'll archive it forever at, uh, or as long as it exists, the University of Florida will archive it and you'll last, your picture and your, your opinions will last that long, longer than your tombstone will. And, uh, and, and I use different uh, techniques to that one, not very often, but, but I did tell people it would last forever, and 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 whoever asks your opinion about anything, the, you are you are the people that are never interviewed, and that's who I want to interview. And then they Michael. Say, all right, Michael. Okay. Yeah, uh, Charlie. Mar uh, Margaret Gillette was next. She's got her hand raised. Then we'll get to you. So Margaret, go ahead. Just a quick question. <laughs> you uh, you uh, travel so much, you talk so much. And we've been reading a little bit about the fact that those who are most adversely affected by COVID have been the people of color, whereas socioeconomically, whatever color, uh, those who are in the who are affluent, upper middle class, often have actually benefited. You know, they can work from home. They made investments. They bought a bigger house. Did you see any of that disparity when you were doing your uh, cross country work? Well, I can tell you, I went looking for it uh, because I'm very aware of the uh, income disparity in America. That uh, uh, American Oz was originally supposed to be about that. It didn't, it ended up being about much more. But I mean, I went to, Rode in, in Hollywood, I went to Rodeo Drive to interview people and uh, interviewed top Hollywood agent. And, and I interviewed people on Rodeo Drive in order to get wealthy people talking about what it was like for them. And, uh, and so what I wanted was viewpoints that might be in the news, but uh, maybe not. And, and, and really you can see the real effects on real people. And, uh, and so some people, uh, one person decided to uh, live in a separate house from her husband because her husband went out. They had two houses on their property. And uh, so she decided to live in the separate house with her daughter because they um, were essentially quarantined. She worked from her house and her husband worked out in the community. So they thought they were going to get it from him. So he lived in a different house than them. Yeah, I saw, you know, there are a million stories out there, but, and opinions. And so, yeah, it's, it's uh, enlightening. Huh. All right, Charlie, you're next, I guess. And then, then, then we'll go to Joseph. Yeah, Michael, I've been involved in a little survey research and I couldn't help thinking that isn't there a bias in your research methods? And your sample is hardly random. Uh, a thousand employees that I represent all work at home. And individuals such as myself and the vulnerable population and other seniors stayed home and cut back on our going out needlessly uh, well, per the instructions of the government so who, who did you end up talking to? But individuals who appear to have disregarded any advice whatsoever. And does that represent the community? This is not scientific, but I will mention in my defense that a lot of these people were at stores. So they were going out to get food. A lot of it was at Walmart, the dollar store, uh, uh, 
and uh, places where they were uh, getting essentials. And so some of them were masking and some were not. And uh, in some states, there was no masking um, required out, out West. And uh, I was, I'm very aware, this isn't a scientific poll, that this is only a hundred people. A uh, hundred people that I'm keeping, I had to throw out. I couldn't post some because of Facebook. I mean, but, I'm, um, I'm involved in public transit and ridership went down to 10% and the streets were empty. There was no congestion. So who did you find out on the streets? But I, I'll use the term questionable people. Well, I mean, I, I don't and think they were the questionable value? because what they were- What is the value like, of their opinion of anything? They, they uh, in this case, I mean, I got a cross section of mothers who were uh, talking uh, outside of a Whole Foods and about their children and getting them uh, uh, graduated from high school. I, I talked to grandparents. I talked to children playing on a square. In that doesn't Illinois. establish a random sample. You know that. It's not scientific. It is, it is America's main street. It touches on some themes and it's interesting. But it is not science. It's oral history, and it's uh, it's compelling. What about and my history? Did you record my history? I was inside. How could you interview me? Do you ever go out for food? Yeah. Once about two weeks, two or three weeks. I might have hit you. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it figures. All right, Charlie. Yeah, I'm curious. A lot of seniors, and they still are, very strict about this. And I somewhat amazed myself to the degree I'm in the senior organization. And yes, they're taking it very seriously. Like oh, absolutely. I, I, you know, and and the, that is good. I mean, I, I'm going to mention that in the book, uh, which is. There are legions of people we don't see and don't talk to. And, and I'm going to mention that it's not scientific. I think everyone who sees it will know it's not science, but it is a, a compelling way to, to ask people who have never been interviewed before what their opinions are. And they'll never be interviewed again, what their opinions are and why they're making it and how they think they're going to live because of their decisions. And and there and and I watch my favorite TV shows are late night uh, comedy TV shows. I, I love those things. But those people are making, they're virtually calling those people out west and in the rural areas, jackasses, uh, because that they're idiots. And uh, but the reality is that they are making decisions much like we are all making decisions. And uh, they're coming to different conclusions. And then uh, my friends in, in the big city, but uh, I went out to hear their, them because they deserve to be heard. And so I, I got the people I could and getting, getting them in places where people had to go, which are uh, restaurants and- uh, uh, Who has to go to a restaurant? I went to restaurants. Yeah, but you said you have to go. No, you know, Charlie, you'll be surprised how many people go no, to restaurants no, 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 for an interview. You know what? You stop quenching for a second. You know, Charlie, you I, I, know, would, Charlie. I, would, I would tend to agree that, you know, there are some people that were out and about a lot that decided to stay at home like you did. And you're just, uh, you know, I, I just, like I said, Charlie, I know you're paranoid about COVID. You've always been that way. But um, all right, let's move on to our next question. Well, he's got Lord. a point. I mean, it, it, there are legions no, no, of people I know, right? who I were know. invisible to my, my uh, project. Mm -hmm. But I got to say, the people that, that I interviewed were invisible to everyone else before I got to them. I think that uh, I'm in Dallas, and I still went to some of the restaurants I really like with friends. And uh, you can find plenty of cross-section people, Whole Foods, all these, the buying. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 
And the only appointment I missed like, was the chiropractor closed for one month. But I went to the treatment center, I went to the doctors, there, there are a lot of people out and about. Our charges are very wide. Unfortunately, by now I've had my three jobs and I do volunteer work. So, I mean, I, I I'm fascinating. And, you know, sometimes those kinds of people that you interviewed, the ones that we saw, they were just so pleased to be able to tell their story. Oh, yeah. They, they, they totally, they totally could mm. not believe someone wanted to hear their side. Right. Oh, they were yeah. shocked. Commuter rails were, were carrying only 10% of the normal passengers. And I'm involved in that. We know I that interviewed a bus driver. Nine out of ten. Nine so out of ten. We're not going out. The trains. You know, so many people in the train. So many people in the bus. They just keep distance. They wear mask. And so many people in restaurant and sitting outside, inside. And you know, okay. So it's not only my opinion. Thank you. Uh, it, it. That's part of what I mean. This is really part of what I went out to show is that we don't all die in pandemics. We live. We live through them, and uh, right. and and plagues, That's and right. uh, so I needed to t find out what is getting people through this all, and why aren't we just giving up? Because and, uh, you know why? Because government, uh, government in some hey, Lana, 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 let's wait for the uh, interview. Let's wait for the. Uh... It's them for they want the people to shut up and they want to they don't want the people if it's like biological war uh, against humanity. I don't know who did. And additionally, pharma, bad pharma, and government. That's what who did it. They 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 try to make people okay. slaves. It's wrong. People need right. to do something about it. Okay. I have heard I've heard this. This is one of the this is several people have had that opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh who else has got the next question? I know you just uh, went, um, Margaret. Uh, I think that's another good thing is that people know that they're not alone, that they're having an opinion that, that other people have. You but know, Facebook doesn't want that. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, go ahead, Joseph. Uh, unmute, please. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Uh, Mike, congratulations uh, for the courageous adventure and for uh, sharing the journalistic piece. Now, you indicated that the death toll exceeded that of 1918 this time around. Yes. Uh, with your first hand exposure and interaction with a diverse large cross-section of the populace. May I request you to step out of your newsman's shoes and share what your opinion is on how the confusion, biases, uh, and suffering around could have been averted this time uh, by governmental, political, social, other initiatives. Um, so I don't know, to sum it up or to paraphrase, I'm asking what is your bigger story about the stories you are reporting? Well, I'm not. I I have not yet decided if I'm going to go there. Um, uh, I did ask people that question. I said to, I asked them, "Is the is the government doing too much, too little? Um, is it reacting correctly? Um, and and what what do you think should happen?" And so that's what I got into. I I think. What I'm going to limit myself to, and I, is because this, as has been mentioned, is a non-scientific uh, kind of compelling story. It's just storytelling, oral history. But uh, I don't want to say, 
well, if we'd only acted earlier, or if we had a clear and honest, straight, been straight with people right from the beginning with one one single uh, narrative that everyone could understand. I'm not going to say any of that because other people are saying that. That wouldn't make it unique. What's unique about this project is that I'm I'm part of it in that I rode that bicycle, and uh, and I wasn't a very good bicycler. I had to get into shape on the road, but. Uh, I really am more interested in the world vision of the people that I saw, and then I'm going to by the by the uh, I'm in the last bits of it, uh, going through all these hundred interviews again, and I'm going to come out the other side, and I'm going to, as Kierkegaard said, look back on life that I once lived forward, and uh, and I will attempt to find the themes and. Uh, the realities that, uh, that that I saw, and I already went. I gave you a clue right there. What I think I'm going to find, which, and by the way, that shows my bias. But my twelve cognitive bias, my twelve cognitive biases, I, I went down the list of, and uh, we all get them, and it's a variety of decision making that people are going through, and and in different parts of the country, and in, in different social groups and uh and uh and coming to different conclusions and and now we're even getting now people are starting to know people who died so down south and out west they're gonna know they're knowing people and they're having to reassess their uh beliefs and uh so uh i maybe should go back out on route 66 and see if anyone's minds have changed but uh that is what I really wanted to find here, what I believe is the best thing that the country could have done. Uh, obviously, I'm a human being and I have my opinions, but why are they any more valid than the people that I interviewed? I mean, their, their interviews are just as valid as mine. Uh, okay, Mike, I, I, I hope uh, I'm not misunderstood here. Uh, we, your journalistic piece and the diverse opinion and experiences you have presented, it is fantastic. Now, because of your exposure, you are in a position, in a vantage point, to have an opinion which is unique and which is valuable to uh, a small group uh, like uh, what we are here, or myself personally. Uh, what is wrong in stepping out of other people's opinions and sharing your opinion. That was the request. You know who else used to say that? Studs Terkel. And in his biography, uh, one of his biographies, autobiographies, he said that journalists put way too much uh, emphasis on objectivity <laughs> and, and not enough on truth. And um, he said that uh, he's never been objective and uh, and uh, he, he thinks that everything should have a, a, a point of view and a bias because we all do. And, um, and uh, I'm reluctant right now to, to say that, even though you're right, I have a, a, a unique uh, vision of what people are thinking out there because I asked everybody and filmed them. I didn't just take notes. I t uh, and, uh, and I'm writing about them and reflecting on them. But um, I think maybe at the end of the book, I might be able to come around to your point of view and, and actually say something that I'll give him my opinion. But I, I, uh, I'm super less interested in what I think. I'm, I'm extremely interested in what other people think. And I hope that other people share that. Uh, that I hope that's what makes the story cycle. Uh, compelling and i hope i uh, tell you guys what it is so you go out and buy it in uh, november or october november okay okay thank you i i, I see the tension Joseph, here. You're very good that you really that asked really good questions that was fantastic I, I am very interested in knowing your point but i think uh you believe it is probably premature or it may impede the work you have put outside there that's fine thank you yeah Thank you, Tim. Uh, you're muted again, Tim. 
All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I would like to ask you a question right now, kind of related to COVID, but you know, you've seen a lot of the fall of printed journalism and news. Um, do you think that a lot of these major media institutions are going to survive or how do you fi find that uh, the news and newspaper business is going to go over the next few years? Uh, well, uh, Colin McMahon, who is the former executive editor of the Chicago Tribune, just got let go. Uh, uh, the former, uh, and he was a pal, of, I don't know, an acquaintance of mine. I used to work with him in the Tribune. And then uh, the former managing editor of the Sun-Times, also a pal of mine, uh, got let go. And um, uh, the Daily Herald is run currently by a, a good friend of mine. Uh, so I know something about the Chicago newspaper market, and I covered it for the Daily Herald. Uh, I have a dim view of what's ahead for the uh, for newspapers, and uh, uh, there is no newspaper for uh, big cities all around the country. Um, even the Cleveland Plain Dealer, uh, their reporters only report in the suburbs, not in, in Cleveland itself. I, uh, I. I have a very dim view. I think they're going to maybe live out our time, but they'll be a shell of what they were and they'll all be on our phones. I think that going to a newspaper box will be a thing of the past. Well, what do you think about like, because the it's already other a thing of the past, there's no newspaper boxes out there. I don't, I don't see it. almost. A, a, well, I, I, I do see. Uh, there are already, yeah, there are some. But yeah, at the same time, I see a public broadcasting station like WBEZ, the, Betterment Government Association. It's a very good organizations taking Those some are of my friends. Questions. Those guys are my friends too. So they're, the news gathering is still going on. It's just transferring. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, yeah, so I know some of these guys. That's probably why I got such good you know coverage is that I was in the news business. But um, I think uh, the news coverage is going to go on. It won't be as good. <laughs> It won't be as good because you're not going to be covering, you're not going to be sitting down with the city budget. There's just no one going to do that. And uh, there's no one going to do it. Very few people do it on Capitol Hill, but uh, no one's going to do it for the city of Chicago. And no one's going to do it for any of the suburbs. No one's going to, you know. I see. They're just not going to be as many people out there doing these the hard work behind the scenes. There's going to be people broadcasting and and uh, it's going to be harder. There's going to be still news out there, but it's going to be we're going to all suffer because for the lack in a in an information age. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get more information, but not as deep as we had when we had newspapers covering every town and in, in the country with numerous reporters. Hundreds of reporters in the case of over a hundred reporters at the Tribune at one time. Wow. So, I mean, I mean yeah. now that, you know, some towns have nothing. Because, I mean, I still find, like, for example, uh, you know, out here in Algonquin, I have the Daily Herald, I have the the Patch, uh, we have a good blog. It's Patch is online. Yeah, we have the, the McHenry blog, they run by Cal Skinner and yeah. There's other places that are pretty good with the news. As a matter of fact, um, a few years ago, I was able to, Republicans asked me to do a debate for them, and I taped it and put it on YouTube, and they were happy as a lark. And that thing got shared I, well, quite a bit, and I was congratulated by the Republican Party for the debate. <clears throat> but, um, you know, that, that's, why, that's why I was asking, because, you know, um, almost anybody can become a journalist today with their smartphones and their video takes and everything else. You know, and I mean, it's the proliferation of information. But what you're saying is that the gathering of professionally compiled information into a readily available source might not be around. Because, like, I see the Guardian out of London with their, you know, with their contributions and everything else. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I know people that work for the Guardian also, and the Daily Herald, I worked for 12 years for them. Huh? I love that paper. Uh, and I think it might be profitable. Uh, uh, as well, the Tribune is profitable. It's just not profitable enough. For in other words, yeah, because I know they had like a 
Well, anyway, do you think that a nonprofit the city, model? The, the Daily Herald is owned by the pay, uh, by the uh, employees. It's an, it's an ESOP. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. And they did that. My friend, Scott Stone, led that effort hmm. uh, to make it an ESOP so that... Uh, so that they could stay independent and uh, mm -hmm. and and the employees uh, were the ones who will decide, um, you know, if there's any cuts, if if they stay in business, if they don't, uh, how much, what's their profitability rate, all that stuff. It's an amazing paper, and uh, you're well served if you're reading the Daily Herald. Well, I, I even uh, even there, though, yeah. I mean, they don't cover every town. And when they do, they, they, they just go to the meeting and then they do write down what was said and then they go home. And, uh, and which is way more than most town gets. But, you know, the village hall, maybe you're, you're in Algonquin, you said? Yes. I bet they have a reporter who goes to Algonquin village board meeting. But that's about it. And uh, uh, when I was out in Elgin, man, we had, we covered, I was the, you know, for a while, I would be <laughs> overnight on the, on the uh, on the cop desk until past midnight, mm -hmm. just sitting there in the police station. Huh. You know, in the old days, with Al Capone, those guys, those gold cop reporters, were doing the same. They were all there. They were there all night long in those police stations. And the front page is a movie about that, you know. Yeah. But um, but that that won't happen anymore. And it's just going to sh keep shrinking and keep shrinking until it's down to. Every, every paper is a small town newspaper. I think basically because those big papers are more at risk. Uh, they're general news and um, you know, things like right. that block uh, party is. I know it was a little bit off subject, but you know, seeing as how you will do it. Now, um, I do know Bob Matters got a question. So Bob, please go ahead. Yeah, Mike. Um, so you started the strip in February of 2020. No, 2021. This oh, year, oh, 2021. Oh, okay, oh, okay. And um, how did you get back? I, I, my parents are down in uh, Florida. They're they're uh, snowbirds. So I flew, uh, I flew to uh, Florida, and I drove them from Florida to Chicago. Ah, okay. But I, I shipped my bicycle back here. I have it. I still have it. What kind of bike did you take? Oh, I thought about giving it away or, or selling it when I was out in California and no one would take it. Uh, it's, it's got a funny story. The two, thing, two funny stories I didn't relate to. I didn't uh, relate to you earlier. One is that uh, the bike is a, an old Panasonic, a silver Panasonic uh, touring bike. Okay. And it goes back uh, 40 years and uh, no one would, would buy it from me out there because it's so old. And, uh, but anyway, I bought this bike in the pandemic, bicycle uh, sales are through the roof. You can't yeah. buy a, a touring bike now. It was <clears> like <throat> out by me uh, where I was living at the time. It was a year and a half before you could get a touring bike. And so I bought this off of Craigslist from a, a Polish guy on the north side from, <laughs> from Poland. And it was this silver Panasonic touring bike with padded handlebars, just exactly like the bicycle that got stolen from me in 1985 in front of a Cubs <laughs> game on the north side. And so I believe... <laughs> that this is the same bicycle that got stolen in 1985 from me, got resold to me in 2021. Oh, uh, did, you put, did you put that in your book? It's possible. Yes, I'm going to put that in. It's oh, you're going to put that thing. in. That's, that's an interesting story. It is, it's very possible that I bought a hot bicycle or, uh, you know, handed off bicycle, reworked bicycle uh, in 2021 that was stolen from me in 1985. Because it is the exact bicycle, the exact make, color, model, even the same padded bars, the same brakes, everything. Wow. And nothing that, had been replaced almost. Not even did, you, uh, did you carry all of your stuff in uh, panniers and bags or did yeah. you have a trailer? Yeah, and I, and I brought a, a, a camera and a, uh, a military grade 
uh, laptop computer. So I had a very heavy oh, bicycle. Oh my God. You didn't, have a, was, you didn't have a trailer. You didn't have a trailer. I, I really thought about having a trailer and I went to uh, my local bike shop and I said, do you think I should have a trailer? And they go, no, it's hard to, it's hard to take them. And you know, you can, if you want, but I said, you know what, I'm going to have bike breakdowns then. And they go, you're probably going to have them anyway. Cause I was heavy. I was heavier than I am now. What was your most serious bike breakdown uh, problem? Uh, well, it was in Missouri before I met that, um, that mo that Ozarks guy, I was in the rain and there were three tornadoes in that County and it was sleeting rain and the rain was so bad. The, the, my tire went flat and my tire was, uh, my back tire was wobbling. So it was, out of it, was, it was out of true and, uh, and it was flat. And so, um, I had, I went to the side of the road. I was in the middle of farm country and, uh, I turned the bike upside down, took off all the panniers and I took that wheel out and I was filling it full of air, but I go, it's not going to help because this is a bent wheel. But I, I'm filling it full of air and I'm going, you know, I knew this was going to happen sometime, but oh man, it couldn't happen at a worse time. I mean, it was only a few feet ahead of you. You couldn't see it, The rain was vertical. And uh, next thing I know, a big white pickup truck comes up next to me and it's a slow talking rural Ozark mountain man who worked mines his whole life. And he was 74 years old. And he saw me out there, there on the road, his wife and he from, from their trailer on the side of the road. And he goes, uh, do you want me to bring you into Carthage? And I go, no, you know, I think I can make this. And he goes, well, Carthage is 10 miles away. And I go, well, you know, I can make it. And if I don't make it, I'll just put my tent up and I'll try it again in the morning. And he goes, and, and in 10 miles, I can get you there in 10 minutes. And I go, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> and, it was raining so hard. I had my wheel in my hand, right? And and he was in his car and you could barely see me. I mean, I could barely see him because the wind and the rain was going. He goes, that that tent is going to fly off in the rain uh, with the wind. And he says, this rain isn't letting up and I can get you there in 10 minutes to a moment. I've, I've, been in, I've been in rain like that where it's, I've been in a car when it's raining like that. You can't see past the hood. Right, right. That just, kind of that kind of thing. Out. Everywhere you and, look, it's just, it's just gray. And it's, it's tornado crazy. alley. It's tornado alley. So there were three tornadoes in that area. It was a real honking storm. I'm not kidding. And that guy says, "In ten minutes, I can have you in a motel." Okay, Stay thanks. Warm. <laughs> I go. I what? I go. I I was really genuinely angry at myself. I go. What the hell were you thinking? You almost turned that down. He would have been here all night in tornado weather, trying to set up a tent for a bike that doesn't work. The next morning I got up and I could not ride the bike like I thought. The wheel was so bent. And then I met that uh, that uh, Ozark Mountain man that we saw interviewed in the first interview. And he brought me into the bait shop, got one of his customers to drive me to the next town, which had a bicycle shop. Got the TV on and that on? Oh, yeah. Joplin, oh, Missouri. By the way. That's great. Okay, uh, Charlie, you have the next question, I believe. Thanks, Bob. Charlie, you want to unmute? You want to unmute? I'm going to lower your hand. Okay, yeah, Michael, ahead. if I'm correct, I heard you say that all opinions are valid. I mean, I've been coming to the college for quite a few years. Yeah. And I've heard stuff that's absolute nonsense. I've even invented a term called gibberosity. <laughs> gibberous. Nonsense. <laughs> I, honestly. Uh, so somebody like my loony neighbor watches a video on YouTube and, and has an opinion on COVID? I'm not certain what what value I would place on it. I go to Zoom conferences once a week put on by the University of Illinois Department of Public Health. Now those opinions I I value. 
but my loony neighbor who saw a YouTube, I, no one in their right mind would listen to him, right? Well, I mean, I'm not saying that they're right. I'm just saying that I think it's natural for us to ask, that, ask ourselves, what are they thinking? And why are they thinking that way? Why, what would make someone come to that conclusion? And uh, I have this on my Facebook page. The guy just asked it yesterday. He says, why is anyone taking ivermectin when the doctors say don't? First of all, some doctors say do. But um, I said, look, they're listening to their neighbor. Uh, they don't trust uh, the people you trust for their information. And they're making up their own mind and they know that the stakes are high. The stakes are their own life. And, uh, and they've come to their conclusion. And that's the limits of, of what I do for this book is see what they are saying and, and how they're thinking and how they came to their conclusions. And is it understandable what they're doing? And uh, I think I, you know, with an early nod to what this is all going to be about it is understandable because we're human beings and we make we make <clears throat> all these mental mistakes every day and i'm no different and uh i don't know about you but i have a lot of stupid opinions that i come around to find are stupid later uh so uh uh, this is that this is what this project is about is to see what their opinions are why they have it and uh, and see if you can get into their minds because we know what the majority opinion is but even there I, I think a lot of the majority opinion isn't the same some people say they're getting the the uh, vaccinations so that because they think uh, the, the vaccinations are uh, bad for you and in fact, there are people in my family who believe this. They think that the, the vaccination is bad for you, but they're taking it because they don't want to hurt the people around them. They're willing to take the bullet because they think this is the only way to assure that they won't be spreading it to their mother and their father and their sister and, their, uh, and so forth. And that's the majority opinion is mask up and take your uh shot but they this guy came to his opinion in a very different way than you would think just because he thinks yes i should take a shot and yes i should uh, mask up doesn't mean he's believes in anything he's a conspiracy theorist uh, you should hear all the conspiracies he, he believes in but i'm thinking of this family member but he did it. He, he's a part of the majority, and his reasons are completely different than you would think. Tim, can I ask a question? Yeah, very go quick. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, very quick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so, by any chance, uh, maybe you saw aliens involved from space? It's possible. Actually, my opinion, if aliens exist, I guess they're pretty peaceful. They don't want to harm our planet. But who knows? I mean, what, maybe they try to punish humanity for to be so uh, mm. negligent and so ignorant and so rude and so worse and, and, and stuff like this. I thought about it and it's not only my opinion, you know, but my, my question to you, you think somehow aliens involved? Do you believe in aliens and UFO? Thank you. Well, uh, I didn't hear any alien talk, but I did hear in Joplin, Missouri, someone told me about their big tornado that came and flattened their city a few years ago. There's a major portion of those people that, in that city that believe that angels, real angels came out of heaven and uh, flew down with wings and everything and helped them. And uh, she pointed out the window of her car. She took me on a tour of Joplin pointed out the window of her car and said, I'm not the only one. We all believe in it. We're all religious here in Joplin. And that right over there is where the angels came and helped save people over the Costco. And uh, uh, I did not see any, no one talked to me about uh, aliens, but I got some, uh, and that was more than once I got people telling me that God was going to save them from COVID. 
That's for sure. Mm. All right. Um, what is your next big adventure, Mike, after this? <laughs> well, right now, I think it's going to be uh, finishing this book. And I'm trying to become a rapid release author. So I'm going to uh, try to do some work on climate change and uh, release a lot of books on that. But uh, the topics I'm trying to choose because I want them to make money because there's a lot of people writing about climate change. So how do you get an original point of view on this? Like this is COVID. How many people are writing about COVID? You know, it's everywhere. It's too much. Everybody's talking about it, but uh, no one rode their bicycle and talked to everybody at the Walmart and the dollar store and at the, on, on Rodeo Drive and on the, the farmer out in the field and the cowboy. No one did that. So I had an original take. But if I can get an original take on climate change, I'm going to try to do that. I, I like the big topics. But I don't like following everybody else. Wait, who's next? Hey, Palermo's Tim's got a question. What? Yeah, Palermo. Yeah. Ahead, yeah. Uh, Michael, have you done any research on during, oh, about storage during the Spanish flu or the polio era to compare any to what you're doing now? I've done some research on those t periods. Like I mentioned that there was misbehavior by the government and uh, there was, uh, we don't know why the, 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 uh, the press did, went along with it, but I assume it was because we were in the war and because the, they were going along with official sources, which is uh, what I would do. I would probably go along with official sources. I wouldn't be able to go with my own, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would be a, a, a crusader going against the, the mainstream, but that most, main, most mainstream reporters go along with uh, what comes out of official sources. Thank you. And, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I've done some reading and, and, uh, and research on that. And like I say, we seem to be repeating all the issues, uh, re the, the mistakes. And uh, the big thing back then was uh, distancing and masking. <laughs> um, I have one more question. Have you done any research on the uh, 1918 epidemic? I and, thought that's what Guillermo just asked. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, you're right, Guillermo. I'm sorry. I wasn't. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have a question. Go ahead, Lana. Very quick. Thank you. Um, so um, from your experience and from your professional, uh, what do you think people have to do about this crazy Mishuge situation what right now with this COVID, Movid, whatever. People isolating for years and afraid to go out, even to throw garbage out or whatever. So what people need to do, what do you think humanity need to do besides vaccination and, uh, you know, and besides this whole panic? Because seems like so much panic. I'm, like I said, I'm holistic medicine and I'm working with many doctors. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I must to tell you, it sounds like maybe it's purpose. Maybe it's conspiracy theory, maybe I'm wrong. But maybe I'm right a little bit. Doctors, uh, scientists, some bad scientists, or not bad scientists, whatever. But it's look like really conspiracy theory. And maybe government together with pharma who try to suck money from people for no reason. Maybe they try to create it more panic among the humanity and make really people to be scared and be slave. And, and limitation for the movement. Look at this, fresh air, look at the sunny days in California, in Chicago we had. It's, it's to my opinion, besides take vitamins, to take care of ourselves, some necessarily medication for high blood pressure. Okay, fine, I'm agree. But even people who do vaccination, do not the people. They don't know people, chronic disease, what they have. 
they don't know people. They just what's the, what's the question? To my yeah. What? Uh, any uh, any further questions? Well, uh, all right, Michael. Um, well, well I'm, I I have to get I have to get running along, but I I just wanted to uh, just reiterate uh, what I said at the end of uh, the last uh, bit that I read, which was that I believe that this project is compelling because it is slow journalism. It is uh, oral history. It is, uh, it is a uh, point in time. It is trying to get into the heads of people what they believe and why they believe it a, in a pandemic like we've gone through from the beginning of time in plagues and pandemics. This one different than others because it may not go away. It may stay forever. Uh, but uh, I think that this is an original approach to it from a different point of view. And uh, that is as far as it goes. It's not scientific, but it's compelling and original. And uh, it's a book that's coming out in fall. And I'd like to make sure that all of you try to uh, get notified. I would like to notify you, Jim, or Tim, and uh, yeah. and then and then let people know that it's out. Um, well, I'm but, gonna be watching a lot of your videos on that YouTube channel for the interviews. It's gonna be interesting. You know, uh, I was tempted to just play for you guys uh, the WBEZ interview because they did a great job of summing up the videos, um, but it's more compelling to watch them. But they, they really uh, did a great job interviewing me and, uh, and capturing some, I mean, well, doing what journalists do, they're capturing the big quotes and pulling them out. And that's what I would have done capturing the big quotes and, uh, and make those big punches. But um, really, this country is full of people who are working everyday jobs, you know, uh, farming and driving a bus and uh, uh, the preachers, I ran into preachers and, and I, uh, there was even a Space Force guy. I met a Space Force guy in, in Amarillo, Texas. And, uh, but everyday people who'd never been interviewed and, and now are able to express themselves. And don't we all want to express ourselves and live on beyond our lives, which is going to be archived in University of Florida for, I, were, I, were, I slept in cemeteries and I looked over at some of the because uh, I was rough sleeping. And uh, and I looked at some of those gravestones and you couldn't read them hardly, you know, especially if they go back to the Civil War and uh, you couldn't read them. And who were these people? Nobody leaves a, uh, any flowers at their grave anymore. You, get, you don't even see their name. There's a stone, but, you know, forget it. But if you're going to be archived for the story cycle, you're going to be as long as America is around you're going to be as long as digital is around someone's going to be able to see you at a certain age at a certain time having a certain opinion about a pandemic and uh <laughs> i would love that it's, it's going to happen with me too because i'm part of the series but it's a it is an amazing time and i gotta say you know i felt guilty about loving it so much because the bicycling was so great oh my god i even loved the bad weather I mean, I hated it, but it's it's an extreme. I might be an extremist, Tim. I might be. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just amazed at all of you, what you've done in your life with so many things. I mean, I for me, it's just been basically, I've been trying to exist at work and come to the college every week and go to my church functions. And <laughs> well, the greatest thing I did this year was see the... Uh, eternal chief out in uh, Oregon, Illinois, with a couple friends of mine when I took a day off work, you know, this year. Who's and the I mean, eternal chief? Um, he's actually uh, out in Oregon, Illinois. I can share a picture of it later on, but it's an Indian chief. They have about 90 feet tall Oh, out in Oregon, Illinois, and he overlooks the Illinois River. Yeah. And Oregon, Illinois used to host the uh, the 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 alternative energy fair for many years and uh 
with me being into the nuclear power stuff and thorium, I go to maybe an occasional thorium alliance, energy alliance conference for climate change. And, uh, you know, I'm fully convinced that we've, you know, at least for me, I'm fully convinced that uh, those small modular thorium based uh, reactors are going to be the wave that solves climate change, you know, because it's the only way that we can really get enough power to get off oil. But like I said, I could talk about that till the cows come home. Well, can, you my... what? can you talk Charlie, about Chernobyl? What? Can you talk about Chernobyl? Yeah, Charlie, I've talked about Chernobyl in the past, and I've told you that that's what the problem is with these uh, present day reactors. They, uh, that How about Fukushima? Had no, had no shielding on Chernobyl. Fukushima. Fukushima, Fukushima was, uh, yeah, those weren't thorium reactors, Charlie. Yeah, they're oh, thorium. They're light water oh, reactors. It's not <laughs> nuclear. Well, Charlie, you know, like I said, you've got you uh, definitely don't know what you're talking about when it comes to the nuclear power stuff, because, uh, you know, we all know the accidents have happened. But anyway, we don't need to go down this rabbit hole right Yay! now. We do not need to go down this rabbit hole. All right. You have, uh, a you know, I will say I will say this about churches. That was a very compelling thing uh, about churches across the country, because people were very concerned about sharing the joy of their life. And I just came off a book about, uh, about traveling carnivals. And one of the points of that was that during the COVID, during COVID, uh, we're not able to share our joy. When we get, we're human beings and we're happy, we want to share it. It's just, it's just in us. And, uh, and, and so church was a very basic need that people weren't getting. And some were getting it, and they were very defensive about it, but they had a lot of opinions why they were going anyway. And, uh, and some were getting it and, uh, and, uh, uh, some, and some were staying away and were happy that way. But uh, uh, it, it's, it affects every part of our life and every part of our psyche and every part, if you're religious, every part of your soul is not, is not being able to get, a, uh, being isolated from other people. It definitely has affected our mental health. And uh, people have talked about that too. And so there's just really nothing it, it didn't touch in our lives. Uh, our livelihoods, our lives itself, our mental health, our joy, everything was, it was affected by it and not positively. And, uh, and yet I was happy as a clam bicycling across the United States. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's great. That, that is absolutely great, you know. Um, all right, Charlie, you had a question again. Go ahead. No, no, I, uh, but if our speaker is going, let me, uh, let's all thank him for a very nice presentation. And all right, and you know what? This. It's the pay. I come back for the pay. Right. It's really worth it. The check's in the mail. Tim told me. When we meet live, you'll get, we'll, we'll buy you dinner, okay? All right, man. I mean, we'll buy you dinner when you come speak live. The last again. one was over three hours. I was talking about American Oz, yeah. and yes. uh, I, uh, but I don't have a book this time, and I, I'm still working on it. In fact, I'm going to work on it tonight. I've been working on it feverishly, like I have a deadline, but I work for myself. I, I just need to eat. <laughs> so I got to get these books out faster. Michael, I have got to commend you for your book. I have to commend you for your coming back. And, and I am just so, in a sense, envious that you've taken the risks to do these things. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm somewhat risk averse. I mean, I, I, I could get a better job or do something else. And I Well, I, I got to say, one of the interviews, one of the uh, reviews that was a five-star review said, Mike is a cerebral man who travels and writes. And uh, I love that. I go, is that what I'm doing? Is that who I am? I didn't know that. And uh, Tim Rooney, who is, uh, whose dad was a pretty famous newspaper man back in the 50s and 60s. But Tim wrote also that, uh, that the, the combination of this uh, Route 66 book and American Oz, he said, uh, I would like to personally thank Mike uh, for being a person who goes out into the country and listens to people, to human beings. And, uh, and I find it great that I know him. And I go, well, I'm inspiring people. This is amazing. This is, uh, I'm doing what I want to do. Uh, but 
these are good. Uh, the first book was so good. I hope that I can make this one worthwhile. Tim, can you do me a favor? Can you go right now and show us for five minutes sample from this Dr. Caldwell? No, we're not going to do Dr. Caldwell at this point. <laughs> if you want to comment on him during a rebuttal period, that's fine. But you can make a speech about Dr. Caldwell. But if you have to go, Mike, we're going to. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Thank you for co-showing up. And at this point, we'll go into a rebuttal period. Thank um, you, all of you. I look forward to this so much. Five minutes each. And thank we you. thank you, Mike, for coming and showing up tonight. We got about 45 minutes here. You're so. an incredible group. Thank you. You're very unique around the United States. I hope you know that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who, if we're going to go into rebuttals, who's got a rebuttal to start, start with? I want to try. All right, Lana, we're going to get make sure we can see you this time if you got your camera open. Maybe. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe. Um, you know, if you're going to do it. So go ahead and we'll give you five okay. minutes, Lana. Okay, okay, fine. Very quickly. Oh, you know, I'm not used to, to do rebuttal, but this topic really sensitive, not only for me. Uh, so I will try to say, okay, guys, you're educated enough, you're smart enough. Please go to YouTube and watch and listen Dr. Caldwell, what he said. What he said, First of all, he's MD, close to 50 years. He know what he's talking about. Oh, is that all you want to say, uh, Lana? Lana, is that all you want to say? Okay, uh, next we have our... Uh, can you hear? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I don't know, it was like a mute in my uh, microphone for a second. You got about four more minutes, so go ahead. Okay, anyway, so what can I tell you? <clears throat> I know it's very controversial topic, it's very painful topic. So what you guys, I suggest from what I hear today from Dr. Caldwell, and please don't be lazy, go to YouTube and listen Dr. Caldwell. He said he believed in conspiracy theory. You understand? Hello? Oh, hello? Anybody can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Lana. I don't know, it's look like mute. No, we can hear you, just nobody's saying anything. Where you got you got you got like another three minutes. Okay, so go on YouTube, please, and listen to what Dr. Cobble said. So he said he believed in conspiracy theory, he believed in fresh air, sunny days, vitamin D natural, how he teach how to take care of ourselves, listen to some doctor and who have dealing with the patient who has chronic diseases like diabetes, like heart condition, Previously, before COVID, you understand what I'm saying? So, but otherwise, need to use masks, gloves if it's needed, and take care of ourselves. And about vaccination, his strong opinion, he have his own experience from his mother sick, from his uh, stepfather was sick, his sister was sick. He believed very much Vaccination is conspiracy theory. Vaccination is wrong in some way. Special people who give vaccination and they don't know people, you know, they don't know how they sick, what they sick previously. And, and it's, it's now it's crazy what's going on. So I listened to what Dr. Caldwell said and I really, really, really agree with what he said. And I follow what he said and Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Hello. Yeah, we're still here, Lana. Okay. All right. So Go on YouTube and watch everybody and listen, Dr. Caldwell, C O L D W E V E L L. Dr. Caldwell. I don't know. Hello. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Lana. All right. Who's next? We're down Thank to nine you. people. We got another bit of rebuttals to go through and, uh, all right, Bob, Charlie, I know you got a Joseph. Anybody else? Doug Binkley, Vicky. Um, if nobody else has rebuttals, we can uh, 
I'll just say one thing. I've been laying down, but uh, anybody who touts somebody that's anti-vax, that's fine as long as you only tell Republicans. <laughs> I don't care if Republicans get the disease. I don't care if they die from it. In fact, I hope they do. You got you got your Trumpers or Republicans. Let them let them refuse the vaccine and let them get the disease and die and just leave this planet to the intelligent, logical people. OK, that's all I'm going to say. OK, um, Vicky, anything? Oh, or let me tell you very quickly. No, I don't think Dr. Caldwell, <laughs> Republican or Democrat. Hey, 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 hey. Vicky, He's a doctor. All right, all right. You, you had your turn, Lana. You yeah, you, you, can, you can just very drop wrong. You can just wrap a weight around your Dr. Caldwell and put him in the ocean. <laughs> we have to put you to the ocean because you don't know you're uneducated. You don't know what you think. You have your stink opinion. They you stink. are pathetic. Go. Okay. I'm very okay. well educated. Okay. I got a degree in physics from the Illinois right. right. Institute right. of Technology. I, I, went to, I went to relativity seminars with famous um, Scientists like Dr. Chandra Secker, Dr. Garoch. I mean, you're you're an idiot. You're an idiot woman. So just go away. <laughs> no, you, you, you Douglas, you idiot. You know, Pridurak is saying Russian and Slovenian language. You 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 Pridurak, you go away. Not me, because at least I'm helpful and I'm useful. You go and ahead you, and tell idiot people you get out of here. Idiot things. Mean, that's fine, but here, really. Go. You know, this is pathetic that you're trying to yes. kill people. Really, it's really pathetic. You idiot! You idiot! You are It is pathetic, but as long as you kill stupid people, we don't need them on this planet. No, you. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, right. Go ahead and tell stupid people to no, listen to your doctor Caldwell. That's fine. Doctor Caldwell, who have experienced almost fifty years, not you. No. <laughs> But you're wasting our time here because no, we like no, to have intelligent no. people here on this no, Dr. Covell, on this college of complexes. That's you the idea. Not. You know, it says college. You That's way. that means usually you want intelligent people at college, not you know, you don't want a college of brainless morons, okay? Or people that are spouting um, uh, opinions that'll kill people, kill other people. All right, all right. Anything mm -hmm. else, Doug? No, I just thought I better respond to that. The guy, the guy who made the presentation, uh, I, I guess anybody can be on YouTube who wants to be, and that's fine. But you know, he, he by him putting these, you know, these yokels, <laughs> these um, morons out there, I'm not sure. To, I'm not sure that that, in, and his idea that. He wants them to, to be out there forever, like what, until the sun dies? I mean, this is incredible. Or, excuse me, the sun enlarges to destroy the earth and the earth dies. <laughs> I mean, that, that is just a little bit kooky. Um, but um, um, yes, uh, people with bizarre opinions or conspiracy theory opinions that don't make sense. Um, Yes, they can be studied because we, we study people who have diseases of all kinds, mental disease included. And so but for pathology, pathological reasons, yeah, I guess they could be out there with a big disclaimer that says moron. You know, if, if, if it says if there's a big thing that says moron, you know, when they're talking, that's OK. You know, or this this person's opinion has been um uh, sent to a professor of psychology to find out what's causing it. And he, he spoke briefly about that at one point. I was I heard that, um, that he admitted you know, that um, even though their opinions may be stupid, that uh, there was some value to them. And in that respect, there is to be studied as a part of mental illness, but uh, um, or as um, a cautionary tale, not to fall for these stupid things. But um, I wish we had John it's Gentry. really, it really is a very sad state, and it, it makes I, I feel so sad and let down by tonight. I mean, I just got on for a lark um, because um, um, last the last uh, last week was good. Um, and I found out a lot of good information yeah. from last week, but um, this. Um, idea that you're going to have morons out there and you know on, on the same 
platform that intelligent people and responsible journalists and and you know a Nobel Prize winners and uh, people who are doing good um, and and it's all the same you know it, it's become terrible that you know that it's just the lowest common denominator <laughs> this country is just beating everything down um, I honestly thought it was there's no respect for intelligence or 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 even genuine creativity anymore it's all garbage you've got you know, morons that are making a fortune with their MFTs or whatever they call them. It, it's just pathetic. I, to some extent, I've just become a recluse and not wanting to deal with the garbage that's out there. Um, I just watched um, the, um, I just watched a, a replay of the, um, um, the great movie um, by um, uh, Charlie Chaplin, um, the great dictator. The great dictator, and uh, it it just made me feel like, oh, how how badly we've come down to the point um, where we have to worry about these things again, and the and you know all the the, the propaganda of the Nazis and the fascists, and and um, it's just sad. Um, um, yeah. I guess the only silver lining is that right now the fascists and Nazis are actually trying to kill their own people, which I approve of. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing that, but um, it's, it's sad to, to be brought down to that level. I mean, because um, in other words, they have brought me down to their level of wishing that they just leave this planet alone and die, um, get COVID and die or, or get long COVID so that you're, um, not good for anything afterwards, which a lot of people do. You know, a third of the people that get it uh, when they're not vaccinated, vaccinated people who get uh, infected usually shake it off. Now, that's the science. That's a, the statistics, real statistics and real science. But um, uh, the people who get it when they're not vaccinated, and I guess our friend tonight interviewed a lot of them, um, they are finding out um, a lot of them are lucky if they're hermits. They, <laughs> they're farmers and they don't encounter people too much. Maybe they, they're not getting it too much. But um, it's sad that um, the fascists and Nazis have brought uh, me down to their level of actually hoping that people die. But if they're going to be, you know, uh, against progress and against other people living, uh, other people having decent lives, they want to drag everyone down. Uh, I say you should go down. They should go down in the whirlpool first, you know, that they cause the whirlpool. Let them drown in the whirlpool. And, you know, it's not uh, my opinion doesn't matter if they're going to die. Let them die. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm happy when they do. So that's I'm sorry that they brought me to that point after, um, you know, four and a half years of Trump. Um, maybe five well, and a half. Don't wish, don't wish to anybody this because it can happen with you. You understand? You either. Well, I'm I'm reducing the probability by being a recluse and by following the the scientific rules of not getting the disease. And I was vaccinated, and mm -hmm. I will get the booster shot and as soon as it's available. Actually, it's available now, so I'm going to make an yeah. appointment soon. And you but, don't um, side effect because side uh, effect. I I'm not <laughs> I, I'm not going to lose any any yeah. sleep or care about psychos that don't care about me. And they are psychopathically deranged people. And they don't care about me because they want to own the libs or they want the libs to die. And they were very happy when Trump was touting um, everybody get the disease when he thought, that, uh, when he thought that more blacks were dying, more blacks were dying from it and blacks wouldn't vote for him. So that was, that was, that was their attitude. And so I, I, I put it back to them. Their attitude of that they wanted liberals to die. Well, I want psychopaths to die. Okay. And if you want to spread a psychopathic thing about not getting vaccinated, if it's psychopathic people that pick that up and die, that's fine with me. Good. <laughs> All right, Charlie, you want to go next? Well, I, I want to go too. Thank All right, no, no, I'll ahead. wait. Vicky, you go ahead. Vicky, please go ahead, and then Joseph will get you next, okay? Oh, okay. All right, I'll okay. give you five minutes, Vicky. All right. I probably won't need it. Um, I was please. frustrated, too. I think Doug brought up some good points, 
Um, my feeling, however, is that a psychopath can nevertheless tell a good story sometimes. Um, my problem was I really didn't hear good stories. He didn't get to the parts of the stories that he thought were most moving. And he said his opinions weren't important, which I would agree. I wasn't really there to hear his appointments. I was there to hear some good stories. And um, when he said it wasn't about his opinion, I thought, right, the focus is on the storytellers, not you. But the focus was on him and him and him and him most of the evening. And he said much the same thing over and over and over again. And so I didn't really get to hear the stories of those, he says, whose stories are never heard. He kept declaiming, but I didn't hear really much of the stories. So I'm not inclined to buy his book. Where are the stories? Um, Actually, he's, uh, if you look at his YouTube channel, okay. and some of the stuff there's really good stuff on there. I know tonight he was talking a lot about himself and the project. Yeah. He does have, I was just looking at some of them, Okay. And he does have some, he does have a well over a hundred videos and they are good. I mean, he just lets them talk. And I think my, well, anyway, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll rebut later on. Well, I think he should, the next speech he gives, he needs to be more like the videos you described. Some actual footage would have been a little yeah. nicer than what he did. Thanks. Yeah. And I think he knows how to do that. It's just, you know, because I know when you give a compelling speech, um, he'll probably do it when he does his book talk. But, you know, he's been, he knows his stuff. And I think, you know, the mere fact that riding a bike across the USA from Chicago to L.A. Mm -hmm. is, is cra crazy enough. And then the fact that he did the videos with everybody on COVID, you yeah. know, they're out there and they're good. It's still a good story. And I mean, you know, with him also working in the carnivals and everything, I mean, I, I just, I was impressed by him, but I understand okay. where we're coming from. You I'll, know. I'll... No, no, Vicki, you make some valid points though. I mean, we could have, you know, we could have had more content. Yeah, and I do. I do. I think, I think you might be right on that score. Okay. Uh, who else is going to go? Joseph, you wanted to speak next. Okay, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks. Unless, you. You're, unless you're not done yet, Vicki. Oh, uh, no, I'm fine. For, I'm fine. Go ahead, Joseph. Okay, thank you, Vicky, for the comments. Okay, Joseph, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, rebuttal. The speaker has some originality in taking a 2,500-mile bike ride during the pandemic, and the unique uh, 100 or so video clips uh, he generated, etc. <clears throat> the Chicago Tribune, I believe, uh, rightfully featured him in the arts and entertainment section. Mike, kudos to your great style, style of journalism. However, unfortunately, and respectfully. I didn't see much of any substantive, substantive value to learn from this presentation. Back to you, Tim. No, no, Joseph, that's a good point because I do agree there wasn't a lot of uh, content in it. It was just all about himself, but, you know, and I agree with you, all right. Uh, Bob, did you have want to say something next, or yeah? Um, All right, I'll, I'll well, talk about it and go ahead. Okay, so I think about it. Lana, are you still here? She's still there. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, you, may, you Lana mentioned uh, briefly just something about aliens tonight, and then aliens yeah. possibly I, I bringing the COVID favorite. over. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, tell you all why uh -huh. give you the scientific explanation of why. There never were aliens. 
there never will be aliens. There is no aliens and why they're quite impossible. They're, from Based on what we know from civilizations, no civilization is ever able to develop people with, or animals or whatever we call ourselves, no civilization is ever, ever able to develop uh, living organisms with high enough IQs to uh -huh. develop the transportation and logistics necessary for, you know, travel in, in space, uh, the, great, the great distances of space. Now, I'm not talking about our little moon shots and going to Mars, but I'm talking about going like from one galaxy to another. Are you believe? Are you believing UFO? No, I don't know. I said there is no UFOs because there are no aliens because civilizations always collapse before there's uh, people reach a high enough IQ to develop the sophisticated technology they would need for this interplanetary travel. Uh, this always happens that as civilizations age. There's a, people in higher IQs always uh, become, uh, you know, they, they always have fewer children. And it's, the, and it's the people with the lower IQs that always have more children. And the, and the, and the over, you know, the, they overwhelm society's ability to uh, take care of them and, and civilization collapses. And then you might have a, a dark ages period, maybe for a thousand years or something, and then it starts over again. And then you have some more smart people emerge, and you know you have like some Henry Fords and uh, some Steve Jobses and you know some Bill Gateses. And then, uh, but again, they never have enough children. And again, the the, the lower IQ people will overtake the civilization; and it'll collapse again. Again, you have this another dark ages period. So this goes on, <clears throat> this is what we know about civilizations. So to do this kind of space travel, which would take moving at the speed of light for thousands of years, you know, on a, on a spacecraft, the logistics of having generations of people living on, uh, you know, spacecraft of going at the speed of light, it's just uh, yeah. it's, you know, way beyond our comprehension and It'll, it'll never have so though anyway so the point is there never was aliens there never was ufos and there never will be there are, is not now nor has there ever been nor will there ever be ufos because no organisms can ever reach the level of iq necessary to develop such sophisticated technology that's okay, it. okay so that's it now, I don't know, on, on tonight's I'm speaker, you got to remember that this guy is just uh, documenting. No, no, this is not a question. This is not Q&A. This is my question. No, listen, listen. No, no, how come then? No, how no, come no. then? No, no, no. Let, let, him, let him finish. No, yeah, no, your time. No. This, yeah, this is my rebuttal period. So, uh, that about our speaker tonight? You know, well, you know, he's, he's just documenting what, you know, basically the man in the street has to say at this time and just uh, and documenting that for the future and that may be interesting in you know many, many years to look back on to see what people were thinking and that's and that's it it's much like a photograph you take a photograph i've you know i take pictures all the time i saw one the other day that uh, gary winogrand took in 1966 and probably the day he took it, it, you know, it didn't seem like much. It's a lady standing on the street corner with a scarf and uh, some traffic, and it didn't seem like much. Now, when you see it 50 years later, and you, you know, now you see the fashions, you see the cars, you see the color, you know, you see the patterns in the clothing, and you, now it's like, wow, this is kind of interesting because you see what it was like 50, 60 years ago. You got that brief snapshot. And that's all this guy's doing is taking a snapshot. I, I myself liked uh, listening to Studs Terkel's uh, interviews with people, and you know, and his, and I've read some of his uh, uh, interviews, uh, in some of his books, you know, his essays with working people, and they're they're sort of interesting, even though these aren't, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning people, deep thinkers or geniuses. These are just common everyday people that work in factories, whatever, and uh, just getting getting their opinion on things. And it's just a just a document, just a documentation, and I, I think that uh, 
that they're uh, documenting what they have to say is just as relevant as documenting what uh, you know PhDs or you know the other other elites. That's have. nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. It's it, Charlie. It's just a picture in time. Uh, it's a it's snap nonsense. In time of what the man on the street is thinking. That's all, all. opinions are equal value. He didn't uh, say that. Well, if, if you need, if you oh, he read, said they're just as valid as a PhD. If you, yes, they are. If you read On Liberty by that John loony, Stewart, that well, loony guy. You know what? You never know. Even the even somebody that's has a, a, the least popular opinion out of everybody else, he may be correct. So it's yeah, it is worth uh, giving that uh, that voice a chance to be heard. If, Ridiculous. If you, uh, well, read, read, read On Liberty by John Stuart Mill, and then come back and tell me what you think. That gets everybody's assignment for, uh, for, this, for this winter, your winter reading. Read On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. He'll tell you the importance of freedom of speech and why it's necessary to listen to even the, 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 uh, you know, the town uh, idiot, because he may have something valid to say. Oh, by he the may. way, what he do you have to what do you have to say about the uh, Milagro workers walking off the job? I think that uh, I think the lot of those Afghan refugees would love to have the, have jobs there, making sixteen bucks an hour. Why can't we hear Tim? Because I muted my microphone again at the switch. Um, anything? Oh, Okay, I guess uh, you're you're still muted, Bob. No, that's it. I'm done. Okay, uh, Vicky and Joseph, um, Jim, you got anything to say or not? Because I know Charlie is going to go. Listen, gonna... I, I have I have something to say to Bob just for a second. You know, then how come I understand what he said because everybody has opinion about you for an alien. But then how come, Bob? How come we in Russia in fifth grade, fifth, sixth grade, we had in our school books, school books, like we even didn't know, like boom, like right away, page about aliens, you know, like visit our planet. When I was in fifth, sixth grade, what, people, what, like make up, how about Leonardo da Vinci? Yeah. Um, um, how come? Charlie, okay, okay, Lana, let's, uh... Because I want to answer, an opinion, kind of. Why don't we save that for after the rebuttals, perhaps? I think you might be right. Okay, let's uh, let's let's uh, let's stop. I, I'm uh, that that's fine. Let's let's go ahead and uh, stop it right away. Um, okay, Charlie, you want to go and do your rebuttal now? All right, uh, I've got four things I'd like to go through. Um, number one, uh, he went through the United States, apparently, interviewing Trump Republicans. Oh, I didn't. And you, you, Tim, and the other guy, Bob there, seem to think there's some value to this Um uh, I made the mistake of living in the country twice in my life, once in the mm -hmm. Western on the Plains, yep. and the other time in Appalachia. And it kind of confirms this opinion that country people are perhaps not up to speed. Uh, I'm still reminded of the guy who asked me how President Truman was doing as president of the United States. I mean, I live in the areas we didn't have TV or radio, and to solicit the opinion of these my loony neighbor, if you think there's some value to this. Now, the other thing is, Bob thinks to think this constitutes oral history. I'm a bit of a historian, and I was involved in an oral history project in Appalachia, but we covered things regarding the culture of the the area, and from the old timers. And the folk tales. Uh, we didn't interview the town Looney. I didn't think he had much value to contribute. No, I don't know if that's who, 
Who needs bad opinions in the future? What historian is going to need this information? I don't know. But uh, three, uh, regarding interviewing people, there's a thing called the go-to guys. When you're a reporter, you have a list of people on topics. And we're often called up, my associate and I, and we buy reporters asking our views and opinions of certain aspects of public transit. Uh, we have to be prepared uh, very often or ask the time to look into it. But uh, you have to be a reliable source of information. Otherwise, you won't be a go-to guy very long. Now, other articles I read, reporters sometimes are indolent and they just ask passengers. Well, that's not someone like the guy in charge of DePaul School of Transportation. His opinion on something I think is vastly superior to just some passenger you pick at random and say, well, these opinions are, oh, they, they've never been interviewed. Well, there may be a reason for that. Perhaps they have no credentials to be interviewed regarding COVID. I mean, if, what? yes, there's a reason for that. Because perhaps what they've got to say isn't of much value. Or perhaps it's worse than that. It could be a harmful information. Um, now, from another four, I'd like to say as a librarian, people would come to me and they would want information. And I would grab them, like people don't realize this, but librarians go to very pains to demand that they furnish information only from very valid, accurate, trusted sources. Even when it comes to magazines, people don't realize it. There's only about three magazines in each subject area that I would trust for valid information regarding the articles. If you get information, I just don't value every single bit of information in the world. Now, I also hear that I'm supposed to give validity to a uh, participant here to YouTube videos. Well, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not valid information. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even use the term information uh, regarding that, but I I I kind of agree. This guy, I mean, interviews the Trump Republicans who are making poor decisions. I I I shouldn't say this, but if I was a public librarian, I don't think I'd buy a copy of this book for the library. Um, I don't see how it serves the world utilitarian. And the other thing, Bob, I, I'm surprised. Uh, Bob Metter just mentioned one thing, that there's some limit to technology. I'd like to know if and when we reach that, what date that's going to happen. Anyhow, that's all I've got to say tonight. Uh, by the way, Binkley, why don't you come back and give a talk? November the 6th. You seem to have a lot of views and might be interesting if you're still on. All right. Take care, folks. All right, Charlie. Well, uh, at this, okay. At this point, I'm going to stop the recording of the college and we'll uh, say mm -hmm. bye to everybody if you want to stick around. But afterwards, we're going to still keep it going. This officially concludes the College of Complexes. Thank you, everybody, for attending.